All right. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's CryoEM Current Practices webinar. You're joining the three national centers established by the NIH Common Fund Transformative High Resolution Cryoelectron Microscopy Program. My name is Christina Zemanyi. I'm a scientist and training liaison at the National Center for uh, CryoEM Access and Training, NCCAT. And uh, today I'm also your webinar moderator. I'm joined today by my colleague at NCCAT, Ed Eng, um, as well as um, Harry Scott and Lauren Hales Beck from the Pacific Northwest Cryo-EM Center, PNCC. Uh, we're also expecting Michael Schmidt from the Stanford Slack Cryo-EM Center, S2C2, but he's running a bit late, but if you see him uh, pop up here, that's who he is. Um, so PNCC has invited today's speaker, uh, Nicolas Coudre, and uh, Lauren will be introducing him um, in just a minute after a brief update from each of the center representatives who are going to give a quick overview of the resources um, available at their centers. Um, uh, these are uh, crime resources um, offered freely to the research community through this NIH program. Uh, for those of you new to our webinar series, CryoEM Current Practices, uh, this is an ongoing event that we host the last Thursday of every month at this same time. And we highlight the methods that researchers are using to obtain and, and interpret the data they can collect at the national centers. Uh, so next month, S2C2 will be hosting uh, Dr. Ashish Manglik from UCSF. Uh, who will be giving a talk titled Solving uh, Molecular Puzzles in GPCR Signaling with CryoEM. So, and uh, you can save the date now for um, the next few talks we have coming up. Uh, we are recording today, and you'll find the recording from today's talk along with those from previous talks at uh, cryoemcenters.org. And on that website, you can also find registration links for future talks. and. Um, You'll also find general information about the larger uh, NIH Common Fund CryoEM program on that website. A couple of final logistics. Uh, so please use the Q&A feature to send questions during the, the talk today. Um, send questions at any point and you can upvote other questions you see. If you have questions directed to logistics or access at the centers, our panelists here will respond to them directly in the Q&A box, and we will save questions for Nicola for the end of his talk, and Lauren will be moderating that uh, Q&A session. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn over to our representatives. Uh, so first up is an intro from S2C2, and Ed is going to uh, stand in and, and tell you a little bit about what's going on there. Okay, well, thank you. So uh, standing in for my colleague, Mike Smith, S2C2 is equipped with uh, state-of-the-art instruments, including three electron microscopes, alpha, beta, and gamma, um, for cryostata collection. And they have two EMs for training and specimen preparation. On the other side, besides access, they have uh, several training offerings, including a Project Taylor training program, which is a short-term one to six week program, a comprehensive cryoEM training program, that's an in-residency cryoEM training program, and workshops. Coming this summer, S2C2 will have an image processing workshop. So if you wanna find out more, you can go to their website. And then I'll transition to NCCAT. Uh, so NCCAT is, as well offers high-end data collection access to Creos instruments. We have four dedicated Creos instruments as well as a robust cross-training program. Currently we're in remote operations, but over the summer we plan on um, transitioning to a hybrid model and getting people more uh, on site. And the first thing uh, in order would be for our embedded cross-training program. We're really heavily working on our cryo mirror badge program. And this summer we hope to start certifying our first batch of uh, trainees in that method. So if you want to find out more, you can go to ncat.nycbc.org. Thanks, Ed. And now I will turn over to Lauren. Hi, all. Again, my name is Lauren Hillsbeck, and I'm the project coordinator for Pacific uh, Cryo EM Center. Um, so PNCC now offers one proposal type for the single particle analysis and tomography. We give up to 480 hours a year for two years. Uh, we have a monthly submission deadline for all of our applications, um, and each approved proposal, we do delegate a SPOC, a scientific point of contact, to ask scientific questions. 
We have five microscopes. We have one Arctica with K3, a Creos with Falcon 3 K3, two Creoses with Falcon 3 BioQuantum K3, and then one Creos with Falcon 3 BioContinuum K3, the newest from Gatan. For sample preparation, we have a Vitrobot, like a GP2, and a Vitrojet, which is currently undergoing validation before being offered to our users. And we're still under COVID restrictions, so we're only offering one-on-one -on -one remote training and small remote workshops. Um, but we're hoping that we can have visitors again sometime soon so that we can offer small on-site workshops covering microscope operation and sample preparation. Uh, so if you haven't already, please apply. Uh, and then I'm gonna transition into introducing our speaker. So Nicholas Condre will be speaking today. He is a senior scientist at the Baba Eckert lab located in New York University School of Medicine and has been with them for about five years. Um, he has created a fantastic talk today uh, that's called Behind the Scenes, Cryo-EM of E. coli lipid transporters. So he will be presenting that next. You can go ahead and share your screen now. Perfect. Take it away. Screen? Yep, okay. I see it just fine. Okay, thank you, Lorraine, for the introduction and thank you all for the invitation. So indeed, today I'm going to talk about all the E. coli lipid transporters. So there are three of them I'm going to talk about that we studied in the past few years in Girababa and Damien Eckert's lab. But before going right into the core of the subject, I just want to take a step back and tell you why we are interested in those kind of transporters at all. So as um, most of you probably know, so gram-negative bacteria are especially resistant to drugs. Um, and one of the reasons is that they have this second outer membrane that acts as an extra layer of protection against aggression like uh, zoos from uh, the drug medications and all external stresses. So this outer membrane is asymmetric and it's made of LPS in the outer leaflet and uh, phospholipid in the inner leaflet. So understanding how the asymmetry and integrity of this membrane is maintained it's quite important because in the future, then it means that we can potentially develop new drugs to target these drug resistant uh, bacteria. So how the LPS are transformed has been pretty well studied and uh, it's achieved by the LPT transporter and the LPS basically uh, move into the bridge formed by the LPTA proteins. However, for the LPS, it's comparatively less studied and it's still quite unknown how the uh, phospholipids compared to the LPS are transported through the periplasm. So there has been a family called the MCE family protein that a few years ago has emerged as potential candidates for lipid transporter in um, those kind of bacteria. And what are the evidences that those kind of proteins uh, could be uh, those that we are interested in for the lipid transport? So first, they're extremely well conserved across double membrane bacteria, but cannot be found in the modern monoderms ones, meaning that they must have uh, some kind of uh, role in the in this uh, second uh, outer membrane. The second, uh, it's a gross assay of bacteria on LB agar, which was done with detergent. And it's a test which is usually used to test the sensitivity and uh, highlight potential defects in the membrane of uh, the bacteria. And it's done with this MCE knockout. You can see that there is indeed a gross effect highlighting uh, potential um, impact uh, on the outer membrane when MCE is absent. The third uh, evidence is that uh, some TLC and mass spectrometry analysis have shown that MCE protein do bind phospholipids. And finally, when we look at the operon, we see that the MCE protein are associated with uh, transporter proteins. So how does the MCE domain look like? So the first one, which was um, the first structure, which was, um, which was done, was done by Damien Eckert and Girbaba a few years ago by X-ray. And here you have a top view and a side view. And you can see that the MCE uh, here, it's called MLAD, it forms a hexamer. And you see that each protomer here contains what's called this famous MCE domain, which is made of seven beta strands. You can note also that in addition to the seven beta strands, you have what's called a pore lining loop here, which is located toward the pore and uh, kind of defines the diameter of the pore of the, of the complex. 
So I'm going to talk about three different E. coli lipids which contain this MCE domain. And the first one is one which where this MLAD is part of. So it's called the MLA FEDB complex. And up to last year, there was only um, low resolution uh, cryo EM maps of the whole structures. And uh, the only parts which were known was the structure of the soluble part of MLAD without the transmembrane helices, as I said, from X-ray. Uh, a low resolution map of the whole complex and a high resolution uh, extra structure of the MLAFB, which is a dimer located in the, uh, at the bottom in the cytoplasm, and which was, uh, um, which was done uh, last year or published last year by our lab. So uh, for this MLAFDB complex, it's located in the inner membrane of uh, the bacteria and uh, it's part of a, what's called the MLA pathway, which was uh, described for the and characterized for the first time a few years ago by Silavi's lab. And in this pathway, so the other proteins involved, it's the MLA-A protein, which forms a complex with OMPF and loca is located in the outer membrane. And there's also the MLA-C, which is a soluble protein, which is thought to shuffle, to shuttle the, uh, and transport the lipids between uh, the two sides. MLAC was also uh, determined by uh, extra crystallization by uh, our lab a few years ago. And in this uh, structure, there was also two lipids which were identified to be bound in the cavity of MLAC. Now, as you can see, the structure of most of the, of the domains of this MLA pathway. And the last piece missing un up until last year was the structure of the whole MLA FEDB, and especially the MLA E permease domain and the transmembrane of MLAD also work. So um, to solve the structure of this protein, so we moved to cryo-EM and uh, we purified the protein and used the nanodisc to protect the transmembrane regions of the whole complex. And in the purification process, so the things which had to be optimized was the position of the histark, for example, and also some nanodisc optimization, like the type of MSP protein used and the lipid concentration. Then uh, we acquired about 3,000 movies in this case, and you can see some uh, example of 2D classes here, which were obtained with Relayan. And um, as uh, CryoSpark appeared, a new uh, version of Relayan also and CryoSpark came. So we kept on using uh, and moved from back and forth from Relayan to CryoSpark to take advantage of the different uh, tools from the different software packages and also the different improvements. So here, I only highlight uh, the steps which did mat seem to matter the most in the whole uh, data processing that we've done. So first one, and you will see later why, it was important to look at the structure in, the, in C1 without any symmetry applied. And then regarding the resolution, the steps which helped us to move, to push the resolution from about 3.4 to uh, 3, 3.1 angstrom was uh, to take advantage of the CTF and aberration refinement and polishing uh, steps in Relayan, and uh, finally finish with the 3D refinement in, uh, in the CryoSpark. When we look at the local resolution map of, uh, of our structure, we can see that the highest resolution is achieved in the transmembrane domain, which was quite uh, nice because this is uh, basically the, the, the only the domain which was, uh, which was unknown at right resolution so far. And if we look at uh, this map and we filter it at six angstrom, so here on the left, the map is colored according to the different domain, MLAD in green, MLAE in pink, MLAFB in blue and yellow. And in gray, you can see two additional densities which wrap around the density of the complex, which actually correspond to the two densities of the membrane scaffold protein of the MSP, which is quite nice to observe. And from the cross section from the top, you can see how it tightly wraps around the transmembrane regions of the protein. And you can see in pink the MLA uh, uh, e uh, proteins, but also in green here, you see now the six transmembrane helices of the MLA D domain, which were not solved in uh, X-ray uh, previously. And you can see how they uh, stand around uh, the MLA E domain. So Mark McRae worked on the um, building the structure for this uh, protein. And here you have an overview. So MLAD stands at the top in the periplasm site, and it also contains six, uh, six uh, protomers. Then in the inner membrane, you see MLAE, which forms a dimer. 
And at the bottom, the MLAFB uh, domain also forms a dimer. And also, con in our case, it's uh, apostate. So, meaning that there's no ATP bound in the site of uh, MLAF. So, what we seen when looking at the MLAE uh, structure of this dimer is that it's uh, MLAE is actually distantly related to the transmembrane domain of the other ABC transporters that are known. And here I put an example of the LPTF uh, G. And except for the additional transmembrane six that uh, of the LPTF G, the fold and arrangement of the other helices is pretty much the same. And those, those participating in the dimer interface, so the helices one, two, and five are involved in, bo in both complexes. And at the top, you see a fold of one of the monomer for each of them. Another thing that you can notice on this uh, model on the right-hand side is that the MLAD is actually tilted relative by six degrees relative to the uh, MLAFEB domains at the bottom. So now when we look a little bit more at this Emily E domain and compare it with uh, the extra structure that was known. So here you see a comparison when we align the two models on the chain A, and you can see that the symmetry is actually broken here. Each grain line corresponds to the movement of the alpha carbon between the EM and the X-ray structure when aligned on this chain. And you can see how the symmetry is actually broken in, the, in, the, in this cryo-EM map. If we look a little bit more at the core here uh, the, at the pore of the of the MLA uh, D examiner. We can see here when you compare so the X-ray in orange and the EM in green that the how the symmetry is broken also on in the, in the pore lining loops. And you can see for the chain C and F how these green uh, loops are uh, kind of displaced relative to those in the six four symmetry of the X-ray. Then when looking at the center of the spore, we can see also densities, which could uh, explain or be uh, related to uh, this asymmetry. And we have associated those with lipids. And when we do a cross section, this is how a cross section uh, would look like. And you see that actually we don't have one, but two lipids located inside, uh, inside our structure. So the first lipids here in pink, you see it's the one which has uh, in a really uh, unique uh, position and conformation where one of the tail is up in this pore that I just, of MLIDs that I just showed you in the previous slides. And the other tail is going down inside the dimer formed by uh, the MLAE protein. And you see that lipid one on the side also has kind of a unique conformation with one of the tail uh, almost kind of starting to go, to go, to go up. And the two head groups of all the lipids uh, go to the side. And if we look at the cross section now with um, surface, showing the surface, you can see that those two head groups kind of point to what cavities that are on the side and located between the MCE domains of the MLAD and the MLAE dimer. And when we look at this cavity where the, uh, where the lipids are located with the holo software, we can see that uh, the cavity, so the cavity going on, going all the way from uh, the lipid uh, and substrate um, site, all the way inside the pore of MLAD and to the periplasm. So that's all this uh, first for this the first protein I wanted to talk about. So which gives um, a nice insight of the wall structure of uh, ML of this MLAD and MCE system with the MLA-FEDB permease and uh, ATP site. But as I mentioned, when we look in um, E. coli, there are other proteins with MCE domain. And the second one I'm going to talk about is called LED-B. And what's unique about LED-B, it's like it doesn't have one, but seven MCE domains. And um, the same, so we use cryo -EM to solve the structure. We also uh, deleted the transmembrane uh, helix of, uh, of the upper, from the upper round and just concentrated on resolving the structure of the seven M soluble MCE domains. So because we were expecting that such a, uh, a long uh, protein would be flexible, we acquired quite many micrographs at that time, so almost 5,000 movies, to ensure that we could uh, also enhance potential flexibility of the structure. Then after a round of 2D classification, 
where you can already see here our top views and potentially also already uh, six-fold symmetry. And after 3D classification, we obtained a map at about 3.3 angstrom. We build a model into this map, and this is how the model looks like. So you can see it also from a hexamer indeed, like the MSCE domain of MLAD that I've shown previously. And uh, because we have seven MCE domain, each domain forms its, its own hexamer. So we end up with uh, something that looks like seven stacked rings. So this is how the protomer looks like. So with the end domain uh, at the bottom and the C domain at the top where the outer membrane is uh, expected to be located. And if we look at the, each MCE domain, so the sequence identity of each MCE domain is really low, like between 17 and 28%. But the secondary, uh, the, the fold of the seven beta strand is pretty well conserved, the secondary structure. So each of uh, those MCE domain also has a pore lining loop. The sequences of these pore lining loops is also different, but also the length is different. For example, you can see here that the length of uh, MCE4 and MCE7 is quite longer than the pore lining loop of MT MCE3 here. When we do a cross section of, uh, of the LFD domain, this is how it looks like. So you can see first the length, it's 220 angstrom which is approximately what's expected to be uh, the, the width of the periplasm in E. coli protein. So it perfectly fits uh, with, within this, uh, this width. The second one here, I displayed only the pore lining loop in red and the MCE domains in gray. And you can see that there is a tunnel which runs all the way from the inner membrane to the outer membrane here, displayed in, in a pink. And that the width and the diameter of this tunnel is actually defined by all those pore lining loops here. So from this structure now, we can have three questions I'm going to try to address. So first question is like, how flexible is this structure? And the second is, are the length and the pore lining loop critical for the function of uh, let be or not? So for the flexibility of the structure, let's go back to the data processing that we did. And if we look at the local, um, local resolution of the map, you can see that the ring number two to four have a much higher resolution showing less flexibility, while ring one, five, six, and seven at the top show a lower resolution pointing towards probably a, a more, flexible, more, more flexible part of the structure. So we did some further 3D classification and we, showed we obtained different maps and the differences between these maps is actually somehow, uh, it's the pore lining loop and the tunnel, which is more or less closed. So basically we have what we can call the closed conformation and open conformation. And I want to mention just uh, something about the, also the local resolution map. So we try for this particular case, we try different software packages. And here you have cross section view of the, of the, of the map with different software packages. And you can see that there are some differences between each of them. In this particular case, when we look at the map, we do know that some of the pore line loops are much lower resolution than the MCE domain. And you see that this is a feature that basically CryoSpark and BSoft um, pick up and represent uh, quite well. And you, and you see here, for example, how the pore lining loop here in the middle of the ring number three and four have lower resolution than the pore lining loop of, number of, the, pole of the MCE number six here. And um, nonetheless, so these, uh, these maps are here of uh, CrowdSpark and BSoft are still uh, really nice. They are really nice to kind of display what, uh, what we observe and the differences what you, that we observe between the different, the different regions of the map. So when we go and build a model in this map, another tool that we can find uh, really useful to uh, assess what are the regions that are properly modeled and those that we need to be more careful in, uh, in, uh, in interpreting interpreting is the using the Q-score uh, tool that's available through Chimera. And uh, the paper was published last year. I took these two figures from the paper. And basically, the idea is to assign a Q-score to each atom of the map, depending on how well it fits uh, the, the densities around, around them. And they've shown that uh, Z-score is somehow uh, related to the, to the resolution of the map. So we've applied it to our structure or one of our structure. And here, I just want to put this as an example. So you have all the, um, the, the residues on the x-axis between 46 to 862. And you have here, for example, the densities and the Q-score the, on the y-axis for ring one up to ring seven. 
And you can see how, for example, the, even though we did three classification, the ring one here, the Q score is still lower, showing that there's still some flexibility in it, while the ring six is uh, perfectly uh, well defined and well modeled. And you can see also here there are some bumps where the, uh, the, where the, the, uh, the modeling is less good, for example, for ring three, four here, and seven. And these actually correspond exactly to the position of the pole lining loops which confirms that they are more difficult to build, but because the resolution is, is also lower. So showing also that these four lining loops here for some of those rings are probably very flexible. So try to push the resolution, the local resolution a bit further. So we used some masking and signal subtraction tools uh, of Reliant and the same. So we explore different strategies, different type of masks, for example, masking individual rings or masking two uh, consecutive or three consecutive rings or masking only uh, all the pole lining loops. And uh, it turns out that the, the maps uh, that were uh, where the information was the most useful were when we used three consecutive ring masks. And here you have a few examples of the three classification that we did after signal subtraction. In all these maps that we obtained, um, we selected six where there was meaningful information six maps here where you have the example on the right hand side where the resolution range from three to four angstroms and the same here the difference between the maps on the left hand side and the right hand side is the conformation so the ones on the left hand side are what we call the closed conformation and the one on the right hand side it's the open conformation now i want to mention two things about those maps so the first one it's about the pole lining loops so when we look at the pole lining loops in general, we see two kinds of pole lining loops. So we see those where uh, the loops can be traced distinctly and in an unambiguous way. So for example, the pole lining loops of the ring number six that we call PLL6, then we can see and trace the backbone and we, we're, we're sure where, where this one stands. And we have others where we do see an extra, uh, an extra density. So it's possible that it's alternate conformation or it's a lipid, but the resolution, the flexibility is too high and we were not able to for sure assign this third density to, uh, to, to lipid or to anything else. And uh, the second, so for zoos where we are able to unambiguously trace the, um, trace the backbone and the position of the, uh, of the, of the residues, it's ring one and ring six. And here you can see the differences of these pole lining loops for ring one and six, and how in one case, the pore formed by these loops is really open. And on the right-hand side, how oh, it's really closed. If we look back at the modeling and the same, we use the Q-score to see how well the model is, you can see before and after. So how the Q-score is improved. So you see in black here, it was uh, the ring one that I showed you before when kind of everything was merged. And you can see when you are able to distinguish close and open conformation, the model is kind of more trustable and fits better and the Q-score is better. And for this one, you can see here in this region, you have uh, the Q-score of the pole lining loops, which can be traced quite nicely and have a higher resolution. And this region here where the Q-score is lower correspond actually to a loop which is outside of the um, ring here, kind of located here. And it's kind of another point where it's the flexible loop that we can, although we can try trace properly, there are some regions where we don't necessarily see the side chains as well. So now if we measure the diameter of these rings, here you can see the expected diameter from ring one to ring seven, and we'll just concentrate again on the rings that uh, where we, the densities are the more trustable, so ring one and ring six. And you can see how the diameter changes from about five angstrom in the closed conformation to about 15 angstrom in the open conformation. So meaning that these pole lining loops are really uh, modulating the radius of the tunnel uh, formed by, uh, by lead B. Now, uh, just to give you an idea in terms of size on how uh, a lipid uh, would fit inside this, uh, this density. So again, this one, this lipid in red doesn't correspond to any density in the map, but I just, put it here to illustrate uh, and give an idea of how big a uh, five angstrom and 15 angstrom uh, diameter is relative to the size of a lipid. And you can see how with a 15 angstrom uh, diameter, a lipid or lipid could easily flow through. Why uh, with a five angstrom diameter, it would be much more restricted. 
So now this is a morphing between the open and the closed state for all the maps that we've, that we've obtained. And you can observe here a few things. So the first thing that you can observe is, uh, as mentioned, the ring two to four are uh, much more stable and we don't see much movement in them. It's actually quite stable and we don't observe a close or an open conformation. It's just one uh, conformation. For the ring one, you can see how it alternates from the open and the closed state. And you can see here from the top view of the closing of the pore. And on the left hand side, you can see the movement and the tilt of the MCE domain. And the same for ring five to seven, you can see in addition to the closing and the opening and the ring six, you can see how the MCE domain kind of are tilting between the open and the closed state. So now I mentioned that um, there are two other questions that we wanted to address, apart from the flexibility. So the, the flexibility, sorry, so there's another way and there's a nice way to, uh, and, um, to show and analyze the flexibility is to use the multi-body refinement. So here, for example, with Reliant, you can see that it shows that in addition, there are some slight rotation of the rings that are possibly relative to each other and some kind of bending as well. You can also do such analysis with uh, CryoSpark and in Cross Park here, we see uh, in a, uh, so also some possible elongation, slight elongation, but also like in uh, multi-body refinement, we can see some uh, slight bending, which occur between the top three rings and the bottom four. So to go back at the other question that we mentioned, uh, meaning that are, is the length and are the pore lining loop important for the function of let V? I'm going to show you two experiments. And the reason I wanted to show you these experiments is also to show you that sometimes just negative stain can be used and can uh, to extract some information and um, can work as well. So in this first ex example, so this test was uh, done by Mark McRae and George Isom. And to analyze whether the length of lead B was important. So what they did is that different constrict where they removed uh, different MCE domain. So because the full length exactly fits the expected 220 angstrom uh, width of the periplasm in E. coli, wondering if we remove these uh, additional rings and MCE domain, first, does the protein fold properly? And then if it does fold, does it function? And to check the folding, negative stain is sufficient because when you look at the negative stain of the seven ring domain, you can count here, you can see lines and you can see seven lines corresponding to the seven domains. And you can measure the, the, the size, which is 220 angstrom. And we were glad to see that all of the other constructs where one MCE domains was removed also fold, seem to fold properly at, in uh, the negative stain map, showing six, five, four, three, or two lines corresponding to the different domains that we're expecting and showing also shorter, shorter lengths. Now, in terms of functional assay, uh, we can see that the truncated construct of two, three, and four rings are non-functional despite the fact that they do fold. However, those with five, six, and seven rings are still functional despite missing only one or two rings. Meaning that it's likely that the length is indeed uh, important, but that there is a minimum length that is needed to bridge the gap and five rings may be sufficient to bridge that gap and maintain uh, the functionality of the protein. The second assay I wanted to talk about is the one that uh, addressed the second, the third questions I was asking. It's like the pore lining loop. We saw that they're uh, defining the opening and the closing on the tube, but is this functionally important or not? So what Georgia did, she did several constructs with uh, so seven different constructs with seven different pore lining loop deletions. And again, so she went to negative stain to see if those were folding properly. And two of them were really stable and folded properly. It's pore lining loop two and those where the pore lining loop three was deleted. And it was really interesting and surprising to us that not only we see the, the rings and the lengths is what we expect, but we also see an extra black dot exactly in the position where we do accept, uh, expect the pore lining loop to be missing. So confirming that not only it falls, but also that this pore lining loop creates a gap. So when looking into, so Zeus fold properly, but when we look at the function of Zeus, um, uh, the cell assay shows that Zeus uh, do not function properly, meaning that the pore line loop are indeed uh, important also, uh, for the function of let B. 
And um, so to finish the story, I wouldn't be really complete if I wouldn't uh, tell about all the MCE proteins that are present in E. coli. And E. coli has a total of three proteins with MCE domain, the third one being called PQID that is represented here on the right hand side. And uh, this one has three MCE domains, which was represented in uh, here at the bottom and followed by a needle. So the negative, so the structure was sold by Cryogen by Girababa and Damianek uh, uh, four years ago. And it also shows that the needle was really flexible and at lower resolution than the rest of the complex. So we went back to this uh, data set because uh, one of the questions that we had, so we show in a bit that it's a structure that is really flexible and the pore lining loop are modulating uh, the, the, the size of the, of, the pore, of the pore and the tunnel. And we wanted to check if this data set also had some flexibility and if it had some flexibility, did it show the same, the same kind of movement? So we put it back to the latest version of, uh, of, of Reliant to do some classification, signal subtraction, and three classification and analysis of the, of the movement. And it turns out that we uh, identified pretty much the same movement as for let B. And here you see an example. And you see the side views and the top views. So you see how in the side views, like what we saw with let B, you have MCE domains which are kind of tilted and seven, it even forms kind of a scissor movement between the ring one and ring two. And from the top view, you can see also how the pole line, how the diameter of the pole is altered, especially for the ring one where there's kind of some changes and closing and opening and even for ring two of, of the pore and how this is modulated uh, by, this, by this movement. So it looks like that um, LED B and PQIB uh, dynamics could be uh, related and are pretty close to each other. So, um, so that are the three uh, proteins I wanted to talk about. And in the same way, Basically, when we look, take a step back and look at this whole story with uh, the MCE domains and the uh, LPT transporter that I talked about in initially, it's pretty much like in New York where we want to go to the city hall of Manhattan all the way to the ball hall of Brooklyn. We have to cross East River and decide whether we're gonna take the bridge, the ferry or the tunnel. And the bacteria have developed kind of the same way to cross the periplasm, if you will, if you want. So with the LPT transporter, it, it looks more like a bridge where the LPS would like cross. We'll have just the, uh, the, um, the tail uh, shielded by LPT8, but uh, the head group will be kind of floating around like on a bridge. You have the MLA-FEDB system, which acts, more, which acts like, uh, like a shuttle. Uh, MLA-C transport the lipids uh, between the two MLA uh, domains from the outer membrane and the inner membrane. And finally, we have the tunnel where the equivalent would be the lead B, where the lipids are transported inside the, the channel. And I haven't shown these results, but um, George Isom also did, show, did uh, run some assay to prove that lipid inside, uh, lipid indeed run and bind inside, inside the channel or bind the, um, the pore lining loop. So, um, so this gives some uh, more insights on the, and more clues on how these kind of MCE domains and proteins could work, could transport lipids, where the lipid bind, where they flow. But there are still many uh, questions open. For example, PQID and LED B are still understudied compared to the MLAA. And we don't know why there are three uh, different MCE domain protein in E. coli. So what are the differences? Do they transport different types of lipids or in different directions? or different speeds. Also, we don't necessarily, so we know that for MLA FEDB, there are some ATP binding sites, so we know the source of energy, but we don't know anything about let AB or PQI ABC. So we don't know what the source of energy is for these two. Also, there are the binding partners and their structure, which is unknown. So for PQIB, like the structure of the PQIA and PQIC are unknown. And for LED B, we don't even know if it actually does have a partner in the outer membrane. Only LED A located in the inner membrane is known as for now. And finally, I want to thank all the lab members uh, who participate in making science in such a nice and friendly environment. I want to highlight especially the people who are involved in this project. 
of course, uh, Gary and Damon, who are awesome leaders, and without who anything would, would be possible in this project. Also, Georgia and Mark, who did an awesome job. And uh, you've seen their name appearing in several, in several uh, slides. And finally, also some uh, rotation students that have been working. So Marie and, uh, and Colin were students in the lab for a few months, but achieved a lot in just a, in just a short time that we're here. So thanks to all the team members. Also thanks to the funding agencies. I want to also uh, acknowledge all the facilities at NYU. So we are really lucky because they always go uh, above and beyond to help us. And uh, this includes the HPC facility, the microscopic core, the cryo EM core, and the central lab service teams who are, again, always uh, really uh, awesome and a great help. And finally, I want to thank all the national centers and the Janelia farm where the, some of the images were acquired and for giving us the opportunity to present uh, this, uh, this and for all the talks and the workshop that they're organizing through the year. It's always great when you collect images to be able to uh, discuss with uh, people who are working in the national centers because you always learn a lot, learn how other people do and can improve in this, in this way. So thanks everyone.